Hello, everybody. This is Darren Potterly. Welcome to Street Beats. I'm here today with John Burns with John Burns Real Estate Consulting uh, in Southern California. John, welcome to the show. It's great to see you. And I was on your uh, your conference just a month ago, and I learned so much about residential real estate overall, the build to rent and single family rental trends that are just you know really impressive growth is occurring within that uh, segment of the residential industry. I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Please introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your firm. Well, I feel like I learned more from you last week, so that was that was good. Thank you. I know my my staff did. Uh, we've got a company of 90 people who we just a big research and consulting firm. We try to figure out what's going on in the real estate market for our clients, which are generally very big companies and, and big time investors. And we do all the research we can and we charge them less than the cost of a person to, to uh, subscribe to it. And one of the things that uh, I've, you know, I, I got exposed to John's work, his, his, his product, his research Years ago, I've been in real estate for about 15 years, sorry, 18 years now. And I've, I've always watched your stuff and said, wow, this is a smaller firm, but really high quality and specialized research product. What was it that sort of turned you on to res studying residential real estate in the beginning? And uh, I just love, I always love to hear the origin story about an entrepreneur. Uh, well, actually, this is going to tie in pretty nicely with your clients. So I, I was at KPMG Pete Marwick way back when, when they had a real estate consulting practice. And the commercial real estate guys were really sophisticated about doing good research. And the residential guys were doing deals on the back of a napkin. And so, um, and I learned that, you know, I'm not really dissing them too much. It's harder to do residential deals because, you know, the buildings aren't the same all the time. It's a little bit easier to do good research on commercial. So I just saw an opportunity to do good research for the residential industry um, and sell subscriptions to our research and do consulting work. So yeah. that's what I did. I started this in 2001 and I've grown slow, steady, steady, no conflicts. We don't do any investing ourselves, which I know most of your clients will not understand. Mm -hmm. But it, it, um, the, the way we build our credibility and I grow my business is by trying to get it right. And if I've got any conflicts on getting it right, nobody trusts me. So that, that's what makes us different is we, we, hopefully we have no conflicts other than to help our clients make good decisions. Kudos to you for seeing an opportunity, right? In the beginning, yeah. like two, 2001, take you back. It's that, that's dot com crisis time. You know, I remember, I remember my, for me, 2001 was a tough year, right? Oh. I, I was in San Francisco and I was in, in, in technology sales. Actually, it was the next it was the next year that I got into commercial real estate because it was so brutal. And uh, the real estate market was actually quite, uh, I guess, relatively affordable compared to like what brought us out of the dot-com crisis. Well, right. the real estate boom, right? Real estate kind of led us out of it. And so but that must've been a pretty brave time uh, uh, to, to start this business and see that opportunity. So that's, inter that's really interesting. Uh, if you fast forward to you know more recent times, in addition to studying where to build residential communities, which is what you help your home builder clients do and institutional clients do through a lot of data, um, you've we've also seen a surge of rental housing, and I, I thought we would sort of jump right into that since we are in the investment real estate space. What has caused this surge of interest and activity in what you call or what the industry calls build to rent uh, communities, uh, purpose built communities uh, for, for rental purposes, and also single family rental. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So uh, when the, a little bit of history here, but I think it's, it's very relevant. So when the housing market blew up, when Lehman Brothers blew up, which was really two years after the housing market turned, but then it got really bad. Yeah, uh, I could tell DC policymakers were making policies, ten thousand dollar tax credits, all this kind of stuff, with absolutely no information. So a guy I knew who uh, who had just left Treasury and was a lobbyist said, "Well, why don't you come to DC with a deck and educate everybody on what's going on in the housing market?" Mm -hmm. and this is this is uh, February '09, and out of that came the idea to build single family rental portfolios. Uh, because, well, we, I won't go into the history on that. So that, but then somebody from HUD 
said, well, you know, we're not going to own these homes. Can you find some private capital to do it? A couple of my clients who got famous shorting the subprime market had plenty of capital and were ready to come in and build up this business. It took the government three years to get their act together. And then Blackstone came in and uh, Wayne Hughes from American uh, from public storage did American Homes for Rent. Blackstone did Invitation Homes and proved that this mom and pop industry at the time, there were 12 million households renting from those landlords. Uh, no institutional involvement at all. Uh, Wayne Hughes, who I don't know super well, but they're, they're a client of ours, had seen the same thing in public storage decades before where there was no national public storage company. It was all mom and pops. Uh, Blackstone, you know, probably through their founder Schwartzman, saw what had happened to the apartment industry over the prior decades where there were no big apartment companies in the 70s either, and saw an opportunity to build up big businesses of single family rental homes. And frankly, with 2020 hindsight, they now tell me that the new technologies that were available that allowed you to communicate with people at auctions, and I can give you an address now, and in five minutes, you can tell me what it's worth and what it'll rent at wasn't available before, but now was available. So then they went public and now proved to the world that, hey, somebody can make a lot of money owning 50,000, 80,000 homes that are scattered all over America. Imagine if you put brand new homes with the same refrigerators, no capital expense issues, because by the way, new homes usually come with a 10 year warranty. <laughs> right. Wait a minute, this could be a new apartment-like product. And so that started really taking off three years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were at the forefront of that because we'd been playing on, on the single family side and, and the uh, for sale side. And, um, you know, interest rates got so low, your clients remember like trying to find yield was next to impossible. And here was a yield backed by an asset that somebody was buying below replacement cost or now build for rent building at replacement cost. Um, then COVID hits, everybody becomes worried about inflation. So what's an inflation hedge? Something where the cost of the structure is likely to be going up, which by the way, we just surveyed our builders. The cost of building a home is up 22% in the last year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for, the guy, for the guys who know how to do it efficiently, the public, the production builders, and rents are up 10%. And they believe, well, if we're gonna have inflation, that's wage increases, which means we can raise the rent because the people can afford it. It's just, it's like a perfect storm. Uh, so I, I mean, in my 30 year career, I've never seen this much money flow into a business so fast. And I was there during the SNL crisis when everybody got rich, then Th this is much bigger. Yeah, incredible. It is the perfect storm, you know, and rental properties, you know, for kind of three main, like historically strong risk adjusted return with rental properties, definitely an inflation hedge, which we're seeing those forces come into play right now. And then, you know, people just love income and appreciation, right? Any real property or any asset that can produce cash is is in big favor right now and especially if it produces cash and appreciates in value which is exactly what we're experiencing in residential real estate as you were speaking i was thinking about something i learned uh, at your conference a couple of weeks ago which is the single family rent rental market is almost the same size as the apartment market or the multifamily yeah. market right they're both about like three and a half trillion dollars of overall value but I learned that institutional investors only make up 2% of the single family rental market, whereas institutional investors make up 55% of the apartment or multifamily ownership market, right? And so there's a lot of, you know, as, as much as they've moved in, in, you know, in the last 10 years or so, there's a lot more that they can consolidate the mom and pop and, and become a, a stronger force. That's absolutely right. And, and, you know, institutions were probably 2% of the apartment market in 1970. So that's the analogy that, that I had. And, you know, a lot, I find a lot of investors don't understand this market because why wouldn't these people own homes? But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's 15 million households that live like this. We've surveyed a lot of them. People forget there's well, you got to live somewhere if you've got a dog and, and you got to live somewhere while you save for a down payment or you just went through a divorce 
or you relocated to Atlanta and you're not sure how you want to stay there, you want to rent for a year or two, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your prior options were to go to the penny saver or online, rent from somebody that you don't know if it's a decent landlord or not. Right. Now, now you can go. Now you can go and, and vet the company, see the online reviews. They've got a call center. Um, there's actually a social element to build for rent because if you're the renter in a in a neighborhood of homeowners, you're the deadbeat on the street. Right. Um, and now, now if you're in a neighborhood with everybody else who's a renter, it's it's a better social environment too. Yeah. Uh, I and. And the risk, the thing I didn't mention earlier, the risk in housing, in construction, in real estate is usually when the market, when the economy tanks, while there's a lot of supply going on, there's not a lot of supply of single family construction right now. So, so that's actually what I think makes it more uh, interesting than apartments, because apartments are coming off a 30 year high of construction, single mm -hmm. family is not. Right. Right. Undersupplied for, for the longest time, never quite made it, made it back from the great financial crisis for a right. variety of reasons, from government regulations to a lot of builders being wiped out and, right. and lower sort of more conservative loan to values or, or less aggressive lending practices to the home builders. A lot of different reasons for that. So undersupplied. And another thing I learned is that a recent study uh, from Freddie Mac says that the U.S. economy is 2.5 million housing units undersupplied right now. Uh, and I, I think that's a correct uh, um, statistic. So we, we've got to match this, this demand that, you know, that is, exists today and will only increase over time. So um, it seems like residential real estate is on a strong footing, whether you own or you or in a rental investment environment. Is that any, any thoughts on that? Well, I agree with everything you just said, except the one thing you didn't mention is that prices are getting a little frothy right now. And so that's, that's the one because of exactly what you just said. So you yeah. go through a period where demand is greatly exceeding supply. What happens to price? <laughs> they go right. up. So, um, yeah. That, that's what that, that that's the concern that we're hearing from people. All right, so so let, let's get let's get into the stuff that I think people are all thinking about, or at least the juicy stuff. This the stuff that is uh, is probably uh, everyone wants to hear. It's like okay, I, I'm being presented with opportunities to invest in uh, housing. Maybe they're just jumping on the bandwagon because that's like everyone's talking about housing, and now it's a twenty percent in some markets nationwide. It is really remarkable if you're fortunate to own a home or invest in some of these publicly traded stocks that are in the residential real estate business. You've obviously, you've probably done pretty well, right? Be far better than you expected. But then there's, there's the, the sort of, you know, other side of it. It's like, this is crazy. Yeah, we got some stimulus checks and the government money supply is, uh, is, is, is extraordinarily high. And yet it's still doesn't equate, especially when you look at like the income uh, relationship to the cost of housing. And it does appear to be bubblish and it does appear, you know, risky. And we went through the great financial crisis. It's definitely different, but like, that's just like that scar tissue, the, those nightmares are fresh in people's minds. So like, I know a lot of people who, who think that, you know, um, the market is overvalued. I'd love to hear your comments on that. And so, I mean, that there, there's a lot in there. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we have a housing cycle risk index and it is flashing affordability alarms right now. So I think those concerns are extremely valid. Uh, mm -hmm. There's no supply alarms at all. The supply is fantastic and there's no demand alarms either other than people, people are now making the decision like maybe I should wait. And I, it's not a one size fits all market. I'll, I'll pick on Austin, Texas for a minute because it's gotten, it's so interesting right now. So mm -hmm. Austin, Texas is the most expensive time ever to buy in Austin, not just from a price to income ratio, but from a payment to income ratio, it's gotten that expensive. And actually they're built that it's the one anomaly where they are building more homes now to, than they were in the prior cycle, 2006. So you would say uh, Austin looks like a complete bubble to me. Yeah. Then we look at what's going on though. The incomes have ramped up dramatically because of all the migration from Silicon Valley 
And we've got some mortgage data that the debt to income ratios on mortgages in Austin right now are among the lowest in the country. So the consumers wow. are not stretching in Austin at all. So the point is, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you kind of the behind the scenes that all the pain that we go through to look at all these things, it's not a simple answer about what the future of these markets are. It's much more complicated. And I, it, I'm not chickening is. out, but I will say the no, is a concern. <laughs> yeah, Austin, I was just down there and my company, CrowdStreet's relocated, has relocated our headquarters down there. And so I was just down there. I was contemplating a move uh, to yeah. my primary residence. My business partner, Torstein, he did this. He just moved, sold in Portland for a record high, way, but way higher than his list price. He was pleasantly surprised with that because that, you know, residential market's on, on fire as well. Believe it or not, you know, yeah. contrary to the headlines that people would think about Portland, Oregon, but, but it is. And then moved to Austin. I went down and he bought, I found, was lucky to even find a house. I went down there on a, in the same sort of like, maybe we'll move. And I was shocked at the housing prices. I, I was literally like, I, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do to try to afford this. Like, and who are all these ultra wealthy people that it can afford Ten or fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a month in a mortgage payment. I mean, the numbers are pretty. Even with low interest rates, you know, the numbers are very high. Um, and had, had, had appreciated. I forget the number, John, but um, their, their housing market has appreciated. It's about thirty percent across. Thirty percent a year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, it's crazy. But but there's obviously a lot of wealthy people, and they're coming from other wealthy places, and the income is tracking with that uh, a price appreciation. So it'll be very interesting to see how it turns out. And in hindsight, I'm sure we'll say, yeah, I saw that, I saw that in the data. And, and but like, it sort, of, it sort of turned out to be true, whether that be a sustainability of the trend right now or some dramatic change. I mean, the, the key thing to prognosticating the future right now, I think is interest rates, um, not, mm -hmm. not, ju not just for owner occupant buyers, but also for investors because the build for rent and the, the apartment communities, as you know, a lot of them are trading at sub 5% cap rates. Mm -hmm. But the reason you can do that is because you can borrow at a 2.5% rate. So you get great leverage and you're probably going to be raising rents. Um, so, it, you know, it's, I think people need to look at it from that lens, not just the, hey, what's the Joe Blow typical uh, median worker in a market? What can he afford? There's a, there's a lot of other investment opportunities going on. Yeah, yeah, uh, agreed, agreed. So um, you kind of getting toward, you know, for investors, we do have a lot of our investor community that, um, you know, have, have enjoyed the price appreciation, maybe they have investments because they're, you know, tend to be experienced investors, right? And whether they own publicly traded stocks or, or REITs and uh, or private real estate through CrowdStreet or on their own account, right? And so they've enjoyed this and they're like, I want to invest more, right? And right. so we have, a, we have a large demand for multifamily acquisition and development. And we have this uh, newfound within the last couple of years interest in build to rent and single family rentals. Are your clients who are investors, you know, still expressing interest in this space? And, oh, big, big time. Yeah. There's, far, there's far more money than there are opportunities right now, <laughs> which yeah. is why cap rates are falling. And it's another reason why build to rent is growing because people say, well, build me an opportunity because <laughs> I can't find an existing one. I would look at it as, as, as Maybe a, a little entrepreneurial, but lower lower risk than an, a, another um, apartment construction, because you don't you you don't need economic growth for this. What you have is you've got 15 million renters, and and you know I think every neighborhood in America almost needs a rental community. Um, so there's a lot of pent up demand, and you mentioned the low market share, which I think is going to grow. I think the risks in this investment are more the operator and the execution on building the home on time and on budget, because as we mentioned, construction costs are up 22% in the last year. That's the risk rather than the, the yeah. demand supply side of things. 
Yeah, the lumber spike that we experienced within the last uh, 90 days was incredible. Uh, totally unforeseen. I, I, I don't know, maybe somebody saw it, but most people didn't. And it got so out of control. It's nice to see it coming back down the earth. But I know a lot of projects got paused and a lot of probably a lot of projects you know, got killed uh, that will need to come back because of contracts expiring and so forth. And um uh, GMPs, uh, you know, expiring. And we, we, we were in the middle of some of those. So yeah, there were probably some opportunities there, but I, I think you're correct. It's one of the reasons why, you know, CrowdStreet, we have a very high bar for the type of sponsors that we work with. We want to work with groups, preferably have done like $500 million in track record over a 10 plus year period. And maybe they did multifamily or single family for sale, but now they're in the build to rent or single family rental market. Uh, those are, you know, track record counts uh, when you're when you have construction risk and development risk because uh, things can change pretty quickly. Yeah, and and that's been the one challenge on build for rent is that very few people have all of it. Very very few people have um, great access to capital. A history building single family homes. They may have built apartments, but single family homes are different. And if, you, if you're a single family home builder, you've got no history with doing property management so, uh, or, and leasing things up. So the, the trick here is, is, and what we're seeing is a lot of companies are having to partner with others to get all the expertise they're doing. They, they need to do it right. And that's, that's where you've seen a lot of the huge announcements with some of the publicly traded home builders where some apartment, traditional apartment capital is partnering up with somebody who knows how to build it. Um, so, so all, they have all the expertise they need. That's exactly what CrowdShoot's doing. We have, we, we have all this capital and demand. In our case, it's from individual Americans, right? Individual investors. They come to CrowdStreet and they're trying to build a diversified portfolio. And it's a form of, you know, old traditional syndication with an online twist. And we might have 250 or 500 individuals pooling their capital together to basically co-invest with a proven operator well, that, that, or developer, right? Um, and that, that operator developer, there was no sponsor. Their other options for the capital is big institutional investors, right? And so right. They, they, they're, we're, we're sort of an atypical capital provider for them, you know, or a conduit to, to individual investors. And so it seems like a great opportunity. And I'm glad you're making it available to everybody and not just the uh, big pension funds of the world. Yeah, we are too. Uh, it's part of the mission and the vision. We, what we set out to do back in 2012 when we started working on CrowdStreet, the concept at the time. And so we've been uh, we've been fortunate and enjoying that experience with all of our investor members. Well, John, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining us on Street Beats today. Uh, you know a ton about this uh, this really popular and uh, highly sought after investment niche with within the real investment real estate space. Greatly appreciate your insight. All right. Thanks, Darren. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show and be well. Look forward to seeing you again uh, sometime soon here. And uh, thanks everyone for joining today.